Welcome to Board Ghost, story broadcast with Games as the Engine. If living is a highway, then heaven is a bus stop. Been waiting for a minute there, but has it been forever? We believe you're out there, hungry for stories for shared experiences. We can't see you, can't hear you, yet we will play for you. This night's offering is a continuation of our game, The Skeletons, using the game rule set by Jason Morningstar, The Skeletons. <laughs> Previously on, we had generated a tomb and fought off a few waves of intruders, sat in the dark for a short period of time, and now we're about ready to get back into it. Uh, before we get into that, our humble players, myself, John Holt, with me. As always, Ken Breeze. Hey, everybody. Liza Courtright. And Lita Tremblay. All right. Welcome back, guys. Yeah, thanks for returning. All right. So why don't we go around and kind of give a, a brief on our characters and where they're at so far in the story. Ken, why don't you start off? Sure. I'm playing the outsider. The outsider is uh, looks like basically uh, almost like a Cro-Magnon ape type of form. Very long arms and uh, a, a big head, uh, a squat torso and squat legs with wide feet. Uh, the, the outsider also wears very ornate and thick armor that seems to have been made out of metal and to resemble the carapace of an ant. And so it, uh, he, he sort of has his helmet on that has ant pincers coming out the top and then a bulbous like breastplate and bulbous shoulder armor and almost like this sort of skirt uh, uh, or, or of ant uh, carapace. Uh, he also carries a long magical staff that uh, can turn into a spear on both sides and maybe do some other things. He has res remembered that he is named Chog Chan and that he was brought to this land from a forest land and served one of the other skeletons, the Silver Torque. And that's outsider Chug Chan. Cool. I am playing the horror. The horror is hybrid composite sort of creature. It looks very bird-like for the most part. Obviously skeletal. Big beak, uh, hooked claws, uh, and it has manacles on all of its limbs, uh, as well as a sort of like big collar. These manacles appear to be magical and have done some crazy things, including reattaching one of the arms after it came off. The horror doesn't remember too much about itself. It was at one point referred to as the Black Death. It uh, remembers having some sort of childhood in this form, although it may have once had another form as, as uh, someone found a skull, a humanoid skull that has once that did once belong to the horror in some other form. Uh, I am playing the arrow shield, human-like skeleton. Arrow shield has recalled that their name in their past life was Aerosmith the Compassionate as evidenced by the fact that it has not, uh, they have not actually killed anything in any of these encounters as of yet. And they have an attachment of some kind, a, a, a love for the horror um, and remembers that uh, there was a, some sort of relationship there in the past life and is very dedicated to, was very dedicated to it reattaching, to, to making it a whole being again when it lost a limb. It also seems to have an a, a awareness or attachment to this uh, field of flowers that used to surround our sarcophagus and is now a barren sort of dusty wasteland. It feels things much more deeply than uh, one would imagine a skeleton would feel things. And it carries with it a uh, shield that is speckled with arrows and has a design upon it that seems to resemble a planet of some kind, and a bearded axe with a long handle uh, that's striped with a similar material to the manacles that the horror wears, uh, and a small axe head and a literal beard hanging off of it. Uh, so I am playing the Silver Torque, who is a uh, ske humanoid skeleton with a, a braided metal uh, adornment about about their neck and collarbone and it rests on their collarbones and has a now chipped and etched silver sword that is dulled and Yeah, it's really snapped. been beat up. Yeah, you mm -hmm. snapped the, the blade in half and got Wrote dulled by mm -hmm. ichor and... Etched, yeah. yep. The... Silver Torque found a ring that it had recognized and 
believed that it had belonged to them, and in it was etched the man, a man's name, a man that they believed that they loved, but they don't know that this ring belonged to them now. They, they realize that, in fact, it may belong to whoever resides in the sarcophagus in the center of the tomb. Last time we had just dealt with some intruders, and then we fell into darkness for a month. Right, and so we'll can go back and start from that darkness. And, and protect, protect the, the tombs, tombs skeletal, skeletal guardians. We are awakened. There's a there's a presence. There's a heat in the tomb that we've not felt in a long time, and it's the heat of life and of youth. And we we hear the entrance of the tomb is open, and there's a storm raging outside, whistling through the like cracks in the rock. And a, a family has entered the tomb seeking shelter from the violent storm. So that is, those are our intruders, a family seeking shelter. The outsider Chag Chan have been actually in darkness for some time, as I didn't wake when the last intruders made their way into the tomb. I am waking now, realizing that I am standing in a bit of a puddle of water, as I realize that the ice that had been previously blocking the passageway to the sarcophagus in the middle of the tomb has started to melt. Not gone all the way, but it's definitely dripping, and water is now sort of making a mess of everything uh, where I am and probably downstairs as well. But that being said, I feel the kiss of life somewhere in the tomb and I am compelled to seek out the intruders and repel them as I begin making my way from the tower through the Schlush gate and towards the front gate. So what is the family doing? It's a pretty small family. A, a grandparent, a single parent, and two children. When we'll say it's a, a grandfather, a mother, and uh, two children. Young children. There's a storm raging outside of the entrance to the tomb. Uh, and it, at first, uh, kind of the, the family comes in and the, the grandfather is kind of pushing both of the children. And the mother is hauling the, the door closed as the wind is kind of howling outside. And you hear cracks of thunder and light. And they kind of slump on the on the interior, uh, take a breath. They're, they're speaking to each other in an, a language that none of the skeletons have heard before and don't understand. Their clothes look long, road, worn, torn. Uh, they're all wearing uh, like these little armbands. After coming through the door, they kind of look both ways kind of shrug and start going to the right making making their way towards one of the one of the chambers and i think at, at one point they they're you know they're kind of going cautiously someone has struck up like a a lantern of some sort and they they stumble across something etched into the wall mm. it's a crude drawing of a spider <laughs> with a with a cross with through a it cross through it you know they're they're kind of speaking to each other and the 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 little one of the children is gesturing to it and it seems that that uh, the child's mother is is reassuring it's like oh no people people coming this way uh, said there's no spiders here so we'll be fine <laughs> ah. uh, and they kind of start setting up a little camp kind of rolling out some some very meager blankets uh, in one corner of this chamber. Aerosmith, compassionate, finds themselves on the floor of this collapsed tower that may have some remnants of spider webbing, though the spiders have not been there recently. And they awake curled around this kind of big spoon around the horror, <laughs> who's also curled up on the floor. They realize that the horror is not 
stirring as of yet. So they kind of give the horror a little pat to seek out. They hear this this sound and they feel this warmth of light and life and they're very curious about it. So they uh, stand and walk very slowly towards the chamber, which is quite close, that the family is now setting up camp in. And they walk quite silence, silently so that they're standing at the very opening of the chamber, but they haven't yet been observed by the family. And yet, they should the light reach them, they would be totally visible behind their shield. Uh, so the, the silver torque is clattering, dragging itself, you know, ambulating past the entrance and a crack of lightning illuminates it in the dark and then it continues on into the darkness. And and there's this warm glow ahead and the, the light, the vitality is there and it feels the compulsion to remove this invasion, this this thing that does not belong in the tomb and, and comes to stand and, and we are now flanking this family, mm-hmm. glinting in the lantern light off of what little silver is there, the torque sword, broken sword and tarnished torque. Chug Chan is sort of keeping pace with Silver Torque are coming around the bend at the same time. Chug Chan is, is in sort of black armor, though the light glinting off of it, natural life off of water or something like that. And as he's seeing this family, he is realizing that though the language they speak is not something he recognizes, he does recognize the, how their clothes are made and even a symbol that uh, the grandfather has on his back. It is a nationalistic symbol of a country or a nation state that his people people were at war with as he begins to remember Mm. his past and that he was dragged from his people a captive by silver torque and their ilk and made serve silver torque for his entire life and not only his life but was relegated to protecting these people and these things that are not his own so far away from his own home uh, in his afterlife as well but he is compelled to as he raises his spear and points it at the mother going ah at the sound of this unearthly noise, the, the mother grabs her two children to her and the, the grandfather kind of steps kind of between Silver Torque, the outsider, and the rest of his family. And then the children start crying out as they catch sight of Arrow Shield on the other side of them. The mother kind of like drops to the ground, sheltering both of the children as much as possible with her body. And the grandfather has like this like very pathetic little knife. Is kind of holding it and muttering what the outsider recognizes as prayers. All of you sense the intention of it, but I think that uh, the the prayer is in perhaps a language that was shared amongst your peoples. Mm. Maybe an, an older language from the region and is kind of shaking, holding up this knife saying these prayers, the the mother is having this realization that it's like nowhere is going to be safe for us. Arrow shields, Aerosmith's compulsion to protect the tomb leads them to telepathically say to their con- skeletal companions, drive them out, drive them out. They begin to walk forward into the compartment in an attempt to drive the family to- literally towards the other two skeletons with the intention of of them going back out the door to which they had come. And he sort of holds his arms, their arms wide uh, with the shield in one arm and the axe in the other arm becoming as wide as possible and advances upon the family despite the prayer. They're, you know, between a rock and a hard place here. (laughs) Immediate threat is the skeleton moving towards them. So the grandfather put him, like he, he turns, kind of puts himself between arrow shield and these guys and is backing you know they're they're definitely hemmed in there's not there's not much room and yeah they're in the antechamber mm-hmm. and, trying and to find a way out they're they're you know the, the the mouth is shutting on them and that's when the grandfather turns to see is, is there any egress you know the looking looking over the mother's head and recognizes the the pattern on the torque on Ooh. silver torque and says like eyes go wide and says a name and the mother like gat the mother gasps like when she says when he says this name but also gasps because a silver sword is jutting out of her chest the mother's <laughs> chest damn you john uh, a jagged <laughs> jagged edge beat me to it as the children scream <laughs> 
I, I think that both of our weapons pierce her at the same time, though you obviously uh, pierce her first, as uh, my spear just goes right through her skull. <laughs> her screams stop as she sort of just is driven to the ground. I say to you, Aerosmith, telepathically, telepathically you are always too compassionate. I think he growls back yeah, at you. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, love it. The mother had seen two weapons coming and, and maneuvered to get in the way as as your weapons are kind of tied up in her body the two children like run like kind of like duck and roll like between between you between your legs probably not between your legs outside her because you're very short but yeah kind of duck around as the mother is in her dying breath yelling for them to run after kind of stunnedly muttering this name to himself the old man is like throwing himself towards you with this knife but he's a frail old man. And yeah, another swing of your sword very easily kind of pulls out of the woman and just catches him up across the throat. It's not a clean cut. And and he repeats the name again as, as, as he's dying. So as Aerosmith is, is taking this sudden loss of life in and watches the old man suffering and the lifeblood slowly seeping out of them and sort of gurgling these last words. They take their their axe and deliver a swift, solid blow to the to the neck of the old man no! to end it quickly and compassionately <laughs> <laughs> and looks up from that blow directly um, into the eye sockets of the outsider, there's just sort of a feeling of of re- reproach and mm. and uh, hostility. Yeah, we're squaring off a that, little bit. That uh, it sort of emanates. There's not even any language yeah. back and forth. It's yeah. just sort of a, a yeah. hostility. Totally. Mm-hmm. totally. Are the children gone? Or are they oh, still? they're no? in there. No, yeah, it's your turn then. I did say the door was shut, so they <laughs> will have to try and open it, I suppose. Uh, yeah. this, this door was shut. Yes. But they've... Yeah, they, they got to get past out of you the guys. Antechamber. So they're sort yeah. of in they this hallway. Us, huh? So the Silver Torque, the name is like a little like flame. And it wasn't just a name, it was also an honorific. Mm-hmm. And no longer like the quiet, like kind of dragging, clacking ambulation. They just turn and the, the lantern is on its side and is giving off less light, but they just are are off, like kind of pull back into the darkness and are gone. And next you see the two boys pulling at the door, trying to like open the entrance again and like get a crack again. And the, as they do finally like kind of wedge a little bit, there's another lightning flash and the torque is standing right behind them. Mm. And then it goes dark again. Dark. Yeah. yeah. They're toast? I think they're toast. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, so I'll, I will actually answer two names. So the the name of this character of the Silver Torque and the by name earned it life based on their greatest accomplishment. Their name was Unamu Enseer. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the full name? That's the name and the honorific? That's their honorific, yes. Yeah, so um, Umamu is their given name. Or uh, Anumu. Yeah, yeah. Unamu. Unamu. And their their greatest accomplishment somehow earned them the moniker, the end seer. That's cool. End seer. Very cool. Do you want to you answer a question? For... Yeah, I already did. Mine was, uh, how did you come to be among these strangers in life and then in death? And I uh, was... Uh, captured at a young age and made to serve for all time. As Arrow Shield made eye contact or socket contact with the socket to socket, socket contact, to socket Tell me contact. More. contact Tell me more. With uh, the outsider, they became aware that that they uh, are all that the skeleton is is wearing a, a pendant on a long uh, silver uh, chain. I am. I am. You are. I am wearing a pendant on a long silver chain. Um, is there something about all of these sort of emotions that have come up that has sort of like brought attention to the the chest? Um, is and the pendant in the shape of a heart? The pendant is is circular. Okay. It is a stone Ooh. that uh, seems almost uh, water like. You know, in this little light that's left over from this lantern that's tipped over, it almost seems to be moving like water, this pendant. And uh, this is a memento from its past life, and it's something that sort of reminds them of, of their purpose 
and part of the story of why they're called the compassionate, because mm. it's not just a moniker of only killing when necessary, but also absolutely without pause killing when necessary. Ooh. Almost like an executioner. Exactly. Um, I'm going to roll off God laughs. God's laugh. Oh, so one. A skeleton's weapon is broken, bent, or rendered useless. What will they do? Note it on their character sheet. As the light comes up and like what little light filters in through the like cracks and rocks. And, like there's also was a small landslide, so there's yeah. it's even more obscured the entrance to the tomb. Yeah. But there's still like a few fingers of light and you see that these like bodies of these boys or children that were like so like violently stabbed and there's a the, sh- the weapon is shattered oh, where it had been like pierced through yeah. them into the rocks yeah yeah and yeah. just pieces of the silver like <laughs> glint in the light silver God. silver broken silver broken shards yep you get to roll on time passes i do centuries, centuries. oh my yep. which one should we do time devours Sure. A crack develops, creating an opening for robbers and other vermin. Uh, mm-hmm. Where? Adjust the map. I want to say like here. Like there? Sure. Like we're in this tumulus and it's sur- a surface crack. Yeah. I kind of like the idea that uh, that these storms have been racking this place Ooh. now forever, for centuries. And so it's almost like an erosion. Like this mm-hmm. is almost filled in. Yeah. 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 There's like an, yeah, exactly. But so, so like the side of the, whatever yeah. had covered it, it is like open. Ero- it just uh, the dirt erodes through like it was, it was just a weak point that no one really realized when this thing was being built that was mostly dirt behind there mm-hmm. all right and so just time so just... over the centuries and how long is how long are we in the dark in this three, three minutes, minutes. Three minutes. Oh my. centuries cool. Skeletal guardians! <laughs> Some of your descendants. They follow an ancient treasure map penned by your own children. Describe how you see yourself in them. Who among you will be the first to strike them down? Can you even bear it? Everyone answers none, one, or two questions as they prefer. Choose once each on the glory fades and God's laugh tables. So we choose on both. Yeah, that's gonna be They're good. definitely my descendants. They're definitely the descendants of Chog Chan. Chog Chan. Exactly. Got Chog it. Chan, the outsider. So they are not from this land originally. They followed a treasure map that I sent back to them. 
I smuggled out of the kingdom somehow when I was still alive. My last and final act of treachery against my captors. <laughs> oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. so they're wearing like different armor than I am, but it's very similar. And it's like centuries better. Like they've Absolutely. been like had lots of time to protect the per, per, uh, perfect, the armor and weapons. So while they might not have a magical staff like I do, they definitely have like the sick ass fucking armor. They dig their way through the original entrance. They don't even come through the, the crack in the wall. Mm -hmm. They find the original entrance and they break uh, their way in and you're playing them, yes. aren't you? So not only is this team of descendants coming through the, oh, the they, entryway. They have the same build that I do, right? Like the yeah. long arms Yeah, centuries isn't legs. quite enough time exactly. for evolution. Exactly. So they are coming through uh, with a machine. Through, <laughs> like a digging machine? Like a digging machine with a long forearm, the likes of which uh, these skeletal creatures have never seen or heard of before. So the first knowledge of their presence comes with this sort of loud mechanical engine sound and the rock and dirt being uh, torn away from the entrance to the tomb until there is a big gaping hole at the entrance. And through that hole, a team of six outsider-like descendants comes through. And yes, they are wearing armor that is sort of a, a shadow of or a cousin of the armor that the outsider wears with much smaller manacle horns. And there also seem to be um, buttons and lights Ooh. flashing oh. on this armor. And their faces are almost entirely covered. You can really only see their eyes through the helmet, but they have the same stature of uh, outsider. With the breaking through of the entryway, the machine cuts out and the six of them uh, enter, climb into this entrance passageway and assess. The silver torque feels this movement and, and is awakened as, as these uh, creatures step into the tomb and begins to stir and strain against the cobwebs that coat them mm -hmm. and that coat the entire passage. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the spiders are, are, it's been centuries. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> there are cobwebs everywhere. Yeah, there's no lack of cobwebs. And so it's obscured as they sort of rise up and grasp at the handle that's just a, a nub now of their weapon and pause and, and start to s sort of sidle back in a way. Yeah, because you're right at the entrance. Yep. Yeah. Towards th this way, toward like mm -hmm. kind of scooting back out this way. Stationed. Oddly enough, I'm stationed back in the place I was originally before the rats came in mm -hmm. centuries ago. I've somehow I apparently like this spot. And I see the silver torque backing up towards me as my consciousness is sort of like spreading throughout my limbs and I'm realizing that I can actually move and I, I, I can take control once again of my body and of my mind. I am so old. I'm so tired. Don't want to move. I don't want to do the things that I'm told to do. But duty, a magical duty, has ensnared and I must act. As I pull free of the cobwebs and it's almost like my skeletal feet sort of melding with the floor almost where I'm mm -hmm. like, it's almost like they're cracks as I'm like pulling my feet out and I am just sort of stomping forward to get in front of the silver torque knowing that uh, I served him in life and I serve him in death though I might not be super happy about it. As I walk by him I do remember the by name uh, by which I was called which was Chog Chan the Destroyer. It's been a long time <laughs> since the horror was awake and it hasn't been dreaming in that time. It's just not been. So the last thing the horror remembers is making new friends. And it awakens buried in cobweb. Claws snicker snack strain to, to cut its way free of this pile of layer upon layer of somewhat calcified uh, spider webs. It actually ends up close to the ceiling after digging itself out and just decides, hey, why not? And starts climbing back uh, towards where it feels life. Uh, climbing along the ceiling, trying to avoid more of the, you know, the stumbles. But you know, there are, are sections that have caved in as these centuries have passed. So it has to kind of navigate around those. And as it's going through the room where the outsider has just left, there's some 
lumps on the floor beneath the cobweb. Yeah, that it doesn't recognize. And it keeps crawling, crawling, looking and seeing these, from upside down, these strange collection of various insectoid shapes. And it makes it makes the horror think of them. Hmm. Because they are good adventurers, these descendants have uh, taken a left out of the entrance. And because they are good adventurers, they are all sticking together as well. And because they are young adventurers, they move, move rather quickly. And so they are moving rather quickly and confidently down this passageway into the sluice room where they slow down a bit. As they go through the sluice room, they notice the skull, horror's humanoid skull, and they pick that up with wariness to examine it, but then very quickly continue on through the passage in the direction that they know based on the map that they carry electronically inside of their helmets um, that the sarcophagus is ahead. Question. Yes. Do they take the skull with them? They do take the skull with with them. They continue on towards the standing tower past the cracked opening. Namu, the seer, the end seer, -seer. steps into that little antechamber and, and reaches to one of the desiccated, mummified bodies, tears the webs away, and grabs the dagger out of... Nice! And continues on into the shattered stairwell and begins to prize its uh, broken sword edge out of the secret door. And that is uh, exactly the thought that Chag Chan the Destroyer has as well as he strides up next to Silver Torque, as in known as, better known as Unamu with the end seer, and uses his magical spear to smash away the piece of silver sword that has been sort of keeping the secret door closed for all this time jam closed he can't help himself as he opens the secret door allowing unamu to go first as if as in life as in death he must serve unamu the end seer <laughs> the horror falls from the ceiling clutching its head in pain overwhelmed with an unfamiliar sensation of pain is partially a flood of memory and partially the feeling that someone is carrying its head around uh, apart from its body, which is very strange. And as it's kind of falling, it instinctively clacks some of its manacles together and the shadowy wings that gave it its name, the Black Death in life, spring forward and it rockets down the hallway (gasps) after the adventurers uh, silently. Uh, Yeah, on black wings, on wings of death. Yeah, rounding the corner towards the adventurers and making straight for that skull. Oh, shit. The adventurers have now reached, they don't even bother to go up the tower, up the tower stairs. They go straight down towards the, the, the passageway to the main sarcophagus room. And now that centuries have gone by, uh, even though this was a magical ice that covered these stairs, it is predominantly dissipated at this point. So though it is still sort of a dripping wet area and the water seeped into the uh, the flower bed it must well. have yeah it must it have must gone have. down the stairs black this mud. yeah this black mm. kind of like royals yeah and that's yeah. what they find at the bottom of the yeah. stairs these roiling black mud that they are uh at first loath to uh step into though they can see across the room their ultimate goal, which would be the silver helm of sight. Sight. Well, the sarcophagus is there as well. Yes. Uh, It is broken and beat up a little bit, but still largely intact. And And like partially submerged. Yeah, a little. Yeah, like sinking a bit into the mud. Maybe actually it's it's not even level anymore. Like one part of it is sunk in, so it's uh, chipped uh, edge. Yeah, yeah. sort of like at a weird angle. Mm -hmm. These cracks have sort of opened up a little bit. Exactly. So maybe the inside of it isn't quite visible, but is definitely more accessible than it once was. These guys, they kind of like, they strap on these, almost, they we would see them as like tennis rackets. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, huh. But they're these frames with like a, a filament yeah. in them and they, they attach them to their boots mm-hmm. ah. and, and start to like move carefully across this mud. The roiling mud. Uh, one of them cries out as they are pulled no! under <laughs> by a pair of skeletal arms. <gasps> They can't see much through their mat, like through their place, face plate, uh, just like mud and, and like an occasional like scraping, clawing hand. And then a dagger butt <laughs> smashes into the face plate and just 
this black smothering mud, and there's a sizzling sound oh. as, and a scream that goes through their calm to the others and their silence. Indeed. <laughs> so Unamu went down the slide, is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Unamu's in the mud. He's in the mud, exactly. And it's, s- in the mud. it's in the mud! It's in the mud! <laughs> it's in the mud! They and, scream to each other. <laughs> exactly. And so Chagchan went behind Unamu. So Unamu is sort of like a fish now, sort of, if you will, or a shark even, uh, in the mud. Chagchan is like rising like a, a titan from the sea. Mud is just dripping all around his armor and coating him. His magical spear starting to blaze with light, a dark runes of reddish illumination all around it. And it's almost like a, just a specter of their past has appeared. Uh, these adventurers, those that are left, realize very clearly that this is the ancient version of what they are now. Whole sort of well-trained samurai warriors, if you want to think of them that way. Uh, Chagchan just begins spinning his spear around as he begins fighting with them. They p- are pulling out like samurai swords, katanas, and mm-hmm. different type of weapons like that as they're uh, just fighting him off. And, and it's uh, they, and battle has been engaged. Chagchan... He, he realizes that he has been cursed. He has been cursed to defend the silver helm of sight. That following Unamu is part of the curse, but truly he must protect the helm. And so, doing so uh, causes him to begin to kill his descents as he slices through one of them, plunging his spear directly into the uh, adventurer's guts uh, as she screams and he throws her away. Into the mud. Into the mud, the roiling mud. Distracted by screaming and an awareness of hidden enemies. The, uh, the intruders do not notice a shadowy form slinking across the ceiling above them. The horror drops down onto the sarcophagus and spreads its, its wings. It, too, has remembered something important. That it, it was brought into this place alongside something else. It was, it was brought here alongside the helm, Ooh. also to protect it. It, it couldn't have been made what it was without the helm. For the silver helm of seeing lets you see through time. The person who, who wielded it made made uh, the horror as as a, a, a weapon and a guardian, which it is still. There is notably some, some similarity between the, the metallurgy on the, on the helm and on the manacles that mm-hmm. line the horror. There's a, a strong kind of psychic message that goes out to the rest of the skeletons from the horror trying without a grasp of complex language to indicate the power in the item and how it could be used to defeat these uh, future beings, perhaps sort of projecting. And I think the outsider sees an overlay of like their helmet that they wear and the silver hem and like turning into these helmets that these people are wearing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think that would be the the best visual metaphor that the horror can come up with. So there are four uh, adventurers remaining, sort of on this path. When they when they entered, they sort of they did split into this room, and and three of them sort of made a beeline directly for the silver helm. And it seems to me that two of those have already been dr- one drawn into the mud, and the second destroyed by the outsider, and the other. Three um, and so the third is still sort of making dogged progress towards the silver helm, and is just uh, standing just before it. Meanwhile, the other outsiders have sort of come over and around the the sarcophagus itself and have been trying to do battle with the outsider to support their comrade to little effect. And then suddenly they they encounter the horror on top of of the dais, um, which makes that no longer an accessible surface. But one of the uh, adventurers who has come directly behind the outsider says very loudly in a language that the outsider is very familiar with, yes, help us, ancestor, help us right the great wrong. And she speaks loudly and clearly, but very directly to outsider, which sort of for a moment at least stops outsider in their tracks. 
And as that happens, the, the adventurer in front of the silver helm reaches in and touches it. As they, this adventurer reaches, they, they kind of are pulling the helm towards them. And there's a void in the center of the forehead of this helm. And, you know, they're, they're cradling it. They're about to, like, you know, encase it, put it in a bag or something. And that's when a pair of arms wrap around them and start pulling them down into the mud. And they're struggling. Their, their arms aren't free. It's hard for them to do it. And the, and the mud is pulling as much as the, as the skeleton is pulling them down. Chog Chan, the destroyer, is faced with his ancestors there crying out for his help but he is compelled by more powerful magic than they their voices the best he can do is back off from fighting them uh, he doesn't help them but he's not attacking them but i think the woman adventurer who was yelling to him her voice as she sees what's going on takes on a, a more of an urgency and more of a ritualistic candor mm-hmm. and she begins shouting incantations and prayers as well but unlike the feeble old man who we'd met before her voice has power and light begins to shine from her as we undead are are given some bad news by that i guess chog chan specifically since he's right there he's raising up his spear to ward off this energy even as his sort of skeletal bone is disintegrating it's like sort of sloughing off and so it looks like pockmarked his face does his arms his feet as he's just sort of almost disintegrating it in the face of the horror was midair as this blast of energy goes out and also like the the energy that's sustaining it as wings kind of starts faltering and it begins to fall uh towards the area where the helm and the 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 adventurer with the helm and where the silver torque unamu the end seer unamu the end seer <laughs> as his friends call him uh, <laughs> Uh, where where they're struggling in the mud. And I think the uh, horror does not have the armor to protect it uh, and just starts falling apart from this uh, blast of light. And its head with the collar and the manacle kind of go rolling towards where this struggle is taking place. And the adventurer sees out of the corner of their eye that this like void in the center of the helm is the same shape as the little tag on the horror's collar. Ooh. And don't forget the circle that Aerosmith is wearing. Mm-hmm. The adventurer being pulled into the mud fears that there will be no surviving this encounter. It throws the silver helm across the dais with the sarc- sarcophagus towards its fellow adventurer, not the woman speaking the incantations at the head of the dais, but they sort of imagine that outsider has been somewhere in here doing battle. That's right. To one of the two other adventurers on the other side. And as the helm goes over the sarcophagus, sort of it it sort of takes on this this light energy that is happening and the sarcophagus splits. And the adventurer catches the helm in their arms. Meanwhile, the final adventurer has has noticed this collar and is and is seeking out, um, trying to find a way to to get to horror. Probably running across the the sarcophagus as it's splitting open. So basically, what's happening is the helm is flying over in this direction, and one of the adventurers is mm. sort of running across the top of it in this direction, to trying to head off horror. And uh, and strangely, none of them are coming to the aid of their floundering friend. <laughs> And meanwhile, the woman who is clearly the leader continues her her incantations in her strong, powerful voice, and the adventurer catches the helm. Silver Torque is struggling, and they're they're disintegrating in this light. It's filling this room. It's blinding. the The mud is roiling and reacting, and like pulling away from the light as well. So it's almost part of the room is clearing under these people. They kind of like fall to the ground, and in the struggle, the torque itself is pulled away, no. and actual like adornment. And the silver torque just explodes, Aww. and shards of like <laughs> fractured bone are like shrapnel just everywhere, shrapnel and and shred most, it, it, with the exception, uh, like as this guy's leaping over this thing, just. Whoosh. Shreds him, mm-hmm. shreds the guy that he was tuff- tussling with, and the and the woman, guy yells the out, chin- "Bogchan, no!" <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> the woman 
mm-hmm. chanting like gets a shard in her head and like, <laughs> just like out. And so the, all, the it's last like through her mouth and yeah. like the back of so her the head. The last person standing in this like you know holding this glowing helm in this desecration as as people just like collapse around them is the guy. There's the one adventurer left holding. Yeah, the helm. there's one adventurer left. Uh, the silver helm is in its hands. Chag Chan has been freed from serving Unamu, who is now destroyed, but not freed from his curse of protecting the Hellstrom, helm. Yeah. He he throws his spear to the ground and starts trying to wrestle the helm <laughs> away from his And the successor. light is at the same time, like, yeah. still eating away. Yeah. Is the light still happening? Through the helm. Through the helm it is. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think as... Honestly, I, I guess as he lays hands on the helm, I, I think his his hands just are sort of disintegrating. Like he's not even allowed to touch it. So trying to touch it, it's like his hands are disintegrating. Right? Yeah, Brian. Yeah, also, also curse bound. The for despite being like pulled apart by this light, like the manacles are trying to pull themselves back oh, together. Oh yeah. Uh, so there's just like it's fighting magical forces and it's a super uh, terrible jerky motion across the room. And I think as the adventurer is like moving the helm out of the way, like of your grasping hands, uh, it just like clocks the horror kind of like in the head with it. Yeah. Just for this really brief moment, the collar manacle and the yes. helm touch. And there's just this sort of like weird like burst of energy. You know those like time lapse videos of someone's like skeleton, muscle, nervous skin system like growing and fading? Mm-hmm. You've seen those? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like that. And for a second, there's just a kid. <gasps> Uh, and then there's a pile of bones. On the floor. Uh, Dust. And what about as as a witness to all of this destruction? Yeah, experiences the horror just completely devolve and then disappear into dust, pretty much. And watching its ancestor shrink away as as they use the helm as a weapon, they're just sort of shocked by it all, but but uh, feel strength in uh, their purpose. And with one final sort of thwack <laughs> with the helm at the outsider, the outsider just sort of seems dazed for a moment, and then just like pieces of it sort of start to melt away into dust. And it and it looks very sad and has great longing, but also there's some relief on its skeletal features. And the adventurer takes the the collar and connect, and it's now con- been connected to the helm. Oh. And sort of as these skeletons sort of have drifted away, the it sort of becomes normal again. That energy sort of starts to dissipate and come back into mm. the helm, which still feels very powerful. The adventurer steps up onto the dais and looks into the cracked sarcophagus. And inside is a creature, a a skeletal form or a mummified form that is the same skeletal shape as the outsider. The adventurer lovingly places the helm on top of the head of this mummy, let's say, and the light continues and, and a woman emerges live and untouched by time from the sarcophagus. that our story ends we will return again with a new tale to spin to dare to entertain i was one of your players john holt you can find me on twitter at lord joho and on instagram at board underscore ghost and you can find my other podcast at newdoyoushow.com ken where can people find you you can find me ken breeze on twitter at burling's beard b-e-r-l-i-n-g-s beard you can also check out my twitch channel of the same name we're doing D on wednesday nights Come say hi. Uh, My name was Liza Courtright. It still is. And hopefully you'll find me here again soon. All right. And I'm Lita Tremblay, and you can find me at my website, 
LitaTremblay.com. That's L-E-T-A-T-R-E-M-B-L-A-Y.com. Uh, or at Lita Trembley on all of the social medias. And my theater company is Caps Lock Theater. That's theater with an R-E. All right. Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah, guys. thank you, guys. This you is out. awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so to learn more about the players and the engine in our story, please visit BoardGhost.com. You can attempt to pierce the veil and contact us at BoardGhostWorld on Twitter. Shout out to the ether if you have desires we can fulfill. Leave reviews and comments on iTunes, your preferred listening portal, and take a moment to subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest episodes. We'd like to thank Pat Couple for our theme song and interlude music. You can find more about Pat at patcouples.tumblr.com or on his band's website, hotelsandhighways.com. If you're not alone in the void, share our stories. The more they are consumed, the truer they become. Dying to agree with me. No. Oh. Dying to agree with me. No.